Today we are talking about the secret gospel of Thomas and we're going to decode its hidden message because as we're going to see, the gospel of Thomas is a gospel that was declared heretical by the church. It's banned from the Bible because the Jesus Christ in this gospel is not like the one of mainstream Christianity. There's no faith or worship or, you know, forgiveness of sin or anything like that. What it's about is about finding secret knowledge and finding the divine truth by looking within. And we're going to see that this gospel is actually a coded gospel. And in the opening lines of the Gospel of Thomas, it says anyone that can basically decode this message will have eternal life and rule over everything. So today we're going to be looking at this secret blasphemous message of Jesus Christ, decoding it and see what it has to say, see what it really is all about. And if you're unfamiliar with the Gospel of Thomas, I recommend checking out my 15 minute intro video that will be linked in the description of this video that will give you a real quick overview on what the Gospel of Thomas is. This video is going to be diving in depth into the Gospel itself as we take it and really dive into it and decode it. And this is gonna be a really excellent stream. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I thought that maybe we'd be able to do one video because it's kind of a short gospel, but looking at it, I was working on the notes uh, all night and it looks like there is a lot to unpack here. So it's probably gonna be multiple videos long. Also, uh, you know, I wrote up some lecture notes for this. It's about four pages now for only a third of the gospel. and. So the lecture notes I'm going to be making available on my Patreon. So anyone who's a patron, you'll be able to have access to my lecture notes for these. So you'll be able to, you know, have notes if you want to review this stuff on your own time. I think it's going to be really helpful uh, for you guys. But anyway, I'm really excited about this. And let's really dive into it and see what the Gospel of Thomas is saying. So one question that we have to ask when we talk about the Gospel of Thomas is the Gospel of Thomas Gnostic. Is it Gnostic? Because the Gospel of Thomas is often associated with Gnosticism. And that really depends on how you define Gnosticism. The Gnosticism that we've talked about lately, such as the secret Gospel of John, it's not that Gnosticism at all. That is Sethian Gnosticism. So in the, in the Gospel of Thomas, there's no Yaldabaoth, there's no Barbelo, there's no Invisible Spirit, there's no Sophia. There's none of that, right? There's none of that at all. There's also no hatred for the material world. The Sethian Gnostics hated the world of matter. They looked at it as an evil creation by, by a devil, Yaldabaoth. That's not there in the Gospel of Thomas at all. The Gospel of Thomas is about seeing that the kingdom of God is all around you and that we can transform this world into the kingdom of God. So, it's very important to understand. The Gospel of Thomas is simply a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what it is. Uh, it was, you know, found in Nag Hammadi in, in, uh, the, in a graveyard near the tombs of Egypt in 1945. But it doesn't have any of these characteristics that we see in Sethian Gnosticism. So is it Gnostic? It depends how you define Gnosticism. Now some people, and, and again this is highly debated among scholars what Gnosticism is, even is. But if you give a very broad definition to Gnosticism such, a, such that Gnosticism is simply a system for attaining salvation by finding knowledge within, if that's your definition of Gnosticism, then yes, the Gospel of Thomas is Gnostic. But we're going to see if that's your definition of Gnosticism, that applies to a, a wide range of systems. So it, the main thing that I want to get across is when we talk about Gnosticism, we have to understand that that is a very broad definition for a system of attaining salvation by looking for and finding knowledge and divinity within. Um, and again, so this is not, this is not Sethian Gnosticism and not associated with Sethian Gnosticism. No Yaldabaoth, no Barbelo, no Invisible Spirit, no Monad, no hatred for the material world. 
Uh, Sethian Gnostics would find the Gospel of Thomas to be very strange because the Gospel of Thomas says the kingdom of God is all around you. It's the world around you. We can shape it. Now, the Gospel of Thomas, according to early church fathers, was highly valued by Manichaeans. Uh, and Manichaeism is another system associated with Gnosticism. Some people consider Manichaeism to be Gnostic. But again, Manichaeism is not Sethian Gnosticism. In Manichaeism, there is the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness, and they are coeval. It's a dualistic system, and the kingdom of light and darkness are sort of battling with each other, and humanity is caught up in the midst of all this. So, long story short, main thing that I want to get across here is that the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus Christ that contain a hidden code. It has nothing to do with Sethian Gnosticism. However, it is very interesting, and what we are going to do today is decode that message. We're going to dive into the scripture itself, take a look at it, and see what it's saying, and decode its hidden message. And one thing that I want to get across here, and I think in an extremely important lesson from the Gospel of Thomas that we're going to see, is the and this is what makes it different from Sethian Gnosticism, is that the emphasis is that the kingdom of God is here and now and all around you. And we have the power to transform it. How? By looking within, realizing that we are divine and that we are God, and we can transform the world around us into a society of the divine, into the kingdom of God. It's here and it's now, it's just up to us to see it and make it so. And this is a really important point. And I want people to realize this, and this is extremely important with regard to Hyperianism, because so many people get obsessed with escape. They want to escape the material world. They want to reach heaven, or reach nirvana, or reach the singularity or reach whatever you want to call it but they, they just it's very very escapist it, it's literally escapism and we have to realize that we incarnate to transform ourselves and transform the world it's about individual evolution and collective evolution so we shouldn't be so focused on escaping but rather transforming we are systems of eternal energy, and energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only transformed. Transforming is our essence. It is what we are and what we do. So we are not here to escape. We are here to transform ourselves and the world. So I really wanna drive this point home, is again, don't, don't become so obsessed with trying to escape, escape, escape but instead be focused on transformation, self-transformation and world transformation. Is this world hell and shitty? Yes, it is right now. But we, once we collective, collectively realize our divinity, can transform this world into our kingdom. It is our kingdom. So let's get to work on this inner transformation and outer transformation. And that is going to be the theme throughout the Gospel of Thomas, is inner transformation and outer transformation, inner realization and outer realization. And we're gonna see this over and over in these teachings as Christ says things like, those who find their inner light spread light upon the world. We're going to find it emphasized again and again, the main theme in this hidden and, and, and secret and coded gospel is about realizing your own inner divinity so that you may recognize and transform the outer. Realize the kingdom of God is here and now. It's not up in the sky. It's not when you die. It's not any of this. It's all around you here and now. You must but realize it and make it so. So let's open this up here. And by the way, we are going to be reading from the Gospel of Thomas, which you can read for free on gnosis.org. 
And once again, I will be making my lecture notes available to members on Patreon. So we start off, the Gospel of Thomas opens by saying, these are the hidden sayings that the living Jesus spoke and that Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. The first thing to realize this is that these are the hidden sayings. And this is important to know in contrast to the revealed sayings. Right away, the author is saying, this is different than the sayings that you are going to find in mainstream Christianity or what you will find in Orthodox Christianity or the Gospels that you may be familiar with. This is different. You're going to find secret information here that Orthodoxy or, will, or what will become Orthodoxy will, will tell you. This is something different. These are the hidden sayings. These are different from the Gospels that you're familiar with. So these are the hidden sayings that the living Jesus spoke and that Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. Now even in the name of the author of this book is a hidden code, Didymus Thomas. So Didymus comes from the Greek word for twin and Thomas comes from the Aramaic word for twin. So Didymus Thomas is literally twin twin and this is saying that the author is the twin of Christ that, it, that the author is a Christ and we're going to see throughout this gospel another theme is that we are all Christ's and in one of these uh, verses. I don't know if we're going to get to it today or not, but in one of the verses of the Gospel of Thomas, it says that you will become Christ and Christ will become you. So, again, in the Gospel of Thomas, even encoded in the author's name, there are you know codes and metaphors hidden throughout this Gospel, and we're going to be decoding and unpacking most of them here, is that you don't need to bow down and worship Christ. You need to become Christ, and Christ will become you. And he said, whoever finds the correct interpretation of these sayings will never die. If you can understand the hidden message in this gospel, You'll never die. Jesus said, the seeker should not stop until he finds. When he does find, he will be disturbed. After having been disturbed, he will be astonished. Then he will reign over everything. Having reigned, he will rest. Now this may sound like a, a very strange verse. But those who are very familiar with the knowledge of Hyperionism and the knowledge that we offer, this will make complete sense. Because when you understand reality, when you first understand it, you are usually very disturbed. And these, what, what, what Christ is really outlining here is that when you understand the secret of reality, the secret of existence, you're going to go through these different stages. These are the different stages that you will go through when you realize your divinity. First, you're gonna be disturbed as fuck. Then you'll be astonished and amazed. Then you'll reign over everything. After reigning over everything, you'll rest. And I bet many of you who have understood what reality is, can attest to this, and maybe you're going through one of these stages. First, you're di you're disturbed. It can be it can be life shattering to realize that everything you knew is wrong. That the world around you is an illusion. Nothing is what it seems. That you live in a collective dream. Everything is different. You see the world through new eyes. This can be very disturbing and disorienting because what's happening is that your old belief system is falling away. Your old way, your old schemas, your old paradigms, your old operating systems. They're all being uninstalled. They're all fragmenting. They're all shattering. 
and your mind is scrambling to try and make sense of a new world without an old operating system, without an old reality tunnel, without an old paradigm, without old schemas to knit it together. All that knitting unravels and what do you do? Well, you need to be able to find a new way, a new paradigm, a new way of looking at reality. And once you be able to do that, which is you know something that Hyperionism puts forward, a system of logic and reason for knitting together the fabric of reality, then you start to overcome this disturbed stage and you become astonished and amazed as you begin seeing the grandeur of reality, everything starts falling into place, everything starts making sense. You, instead of being disturbed, you're now astonished and amazed at the new world. Then he will reign over everything. Another translation says he will reign over the all, and I love that. And what happens is that once we all attain our divinity as a collective, we will be able to reign over this world. We'll be able to reign over the universe ultimately because we realize that this is our collective creation. This is our collective dream world. And it's very much akin to becoming lucid in a dream. When you're lucid in a dream, you realize that you can reign over that dream, that you have power over that dream. Well, same thing here. Once you really understand what reality is, you realize you have power over that reality. You have power to control it. And then having reigned, he will rest. Once we, once we rule the universe, once we reign over the all, because we are the all, we will reach the omega point, and that will be a, 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 a point of rest, a point of utter completion. Because we will have maximized our, actu our actualization we will have maximized our experience. We will have maximized absolutely everything. And then we rest until we start the game all over again. But this is what Christ means when he says the seeker should not stop until he finds. When he does find, he will be disturbed. After having been disturbed, he will be astonished. Then he will reign over everything. Having reigned, he will rest. These are the different stages of the evolution of consciousness as you come to new knowledge and a new understanding. Jesus said, if your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in the sky, then the birds will be there before you are. If they say that the kingdom is in the sea, then the fish will be there before you are. Rather, the kingdom is within you and it is outside of you. Jesus is basically mocking what Orthodox Christianity will eventually say. You know, if you're looking for the kingdom of heaven in the sky, if you're looking for some heaven or God in the sky, hey, the birds are going to be there before you are. Jesus is saying, that's ridiculous. That's stupid. Come on. Really? Really? You're looking for heaven in the sky? How, you know, how basic do you have to be? He's saying that, look, the kingdom isn't anywhere else. It's not in the sky. It's not under the sea. You know, it's not sometime in the future. You don't have to wait for a second coming. The kingdom is within you and it's outside of you. Divinity is within. That's why, you know, the, the, the aphorism, know thyself. Know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. Because you are the universe and the gods. When you look within, you will understand your divinity. And, the king, and, and once you understand your divinity, you will realize that the kingdom of God isn't in heaven. It's not under the sea. It's not in the sky. It's not in the future. It's right here, right now, all around you. This is our world. This is our dream. We created it. It's here. It's now. Can you not see it? Can you not see it? Now, right now, it's being it's a terrible place because it's being destroyed by those who don't know their divinity, by the endarkened ones rather than the enlightened ones. And Christ will go on to say that those who have known their own light will spread light upon the world, but those who know their darkness will endarken the world, essentially, more or less. We'll see what he says. And this is very, very true in that those who rule the world right now are in darkened ones and they just spread darkness. You know, the rich elite billionaire class who don't give a fuck about the collective, but rather just themselves. So once we attain our divinity and establish a divine society, we will take back our kingdom. And that's what we are here to do. Realize the kingdom of God is within and without. And to take it back and establish it right here and right now, 
Not in the future, not when you die, not in the sky. Now. When you understand yourselves, when you understand yourselves, you will be understood and you will realize that you are sons of the living Father. If you do not know yourselves, then you exist in poverty and you are that poverty. So when you understand yourselves, when you look within, you will realize that you are sons of the living Father. This means that you are gods. Sons of the living Father mean that we are all monadic expressions of the divine mind. But we are the divine mind. So what, what this means, sons of the living Father, and I'm going to show you this diagram that you know most of you are familiar with, but this here is you know a symbol that we use to represent the absolute. And the absolute what is being spoken about here is this great circle. And this is what is called the father. Now, again, it's not a father or a mother or, or anything like that. It's, that's just how the Gospel of Thomas refers it to. It's not male or female, it's just a thing. It's just a thing, it's a collective, it's the absolute. And each one of these circles is a monadic mind or a soul. And that's what each one of us are. So each and every one of us are, you know, in, in the coded metaphorical terms of the Gospel of Thomas, sons of the living Father, monadic nodes of the absolute mind. But it's important to know that we are the absolute and we are uh, the divine mind. We are, we are both the individual nodes and the collective at the same time. So the collective is only formed by the individual nodes. If you remove the individual nodes, the collective wouldn't exist. So the collective depends on the nodes for its existence. So this collective, the circle of circles, is nothing to worship. It is what we are together. It's what we make up. It's our collective actualization. If, we th if we're thinking in terms of a neural network, you know, in, in computer science, if we're, if we're thinking in terms of a, a neural network, You know, each one of these circles represents a node, and the entire network itself is is the collective. But you see, if we remove the individual nodes, the, the collective would vanish. So that's what it means. We are individual monadic minds, part of this collective. And we are gods. We are these all-powerful nodes that together collectively found uh, you know form this collective. And ignore the, the masculine, you know, father and son thing. You know, that's just how they spoke in the Gospel of Thomas. I'm not a fan of all this masculine wording. I but you know, for the time it was written in, that's that's just how they worded things. But when you understand yourselves, you will realize that you are sons of the living father. You are gods. If you do not know yourselves, then you exist in poverty and you are that poverty. It's important to understand that in the Gospel of Thomas, this is another code that we're going to run into a lot, that being rich and having is a code for knowing your own divinity and not having and being in poverty is code for not knowing your own divinity, being ignorant to your divinity. Because we're going to see this reference later, this idea of wealth or riches versus being in poverty. Wealth and riches is code for knowing your own divinity. Poverty is associated with ignorance of your divinity. So that will be something important to remember. Jesus said, the old man will not hesitate to ask a seven-day-old baby about the place of life, and he will live. Now, this is another code that we have to remember. In uh, the Gospel of Thomas, becoming a baby is a code for understanding everything. 
And why is it a code for understanding everything? Because so when we talk about the, you know, you'll notice here that it says the seven day old baby. So seven day old is a reference to the creation myth. You know, the myth is the the earth was created in seven days. So that's a reference to the beginning. So a seven day old baby is a reference to, uh, you know, the old man will not hesitate to ask a seven day old baby about the place of life and he will live. Having knowledge of the seven day old baby is code for understanding the beginning. Because as another, um, throughout the Gospel of Thomas, what we're going to see as well is that we, when you understand the beginning, you understand the end, and you understand everything. So to understand the beginning is to understand the end and is to understand everything. So we'll see a reference again and again to having knowledge of a baby, and that's a reference to the seven-day-old baby, which is a reference to un which is a code for understanding the beginning. And again, why is understanding the beginning, understanding the end, and understanding everything? Because the end is the beginning. We live in a cyclic reality, and at the end of every universal cycle is the beginning of a new universal cycle. When this universe ends, a new universe begins. So when you understand the beginning, how the universe began, you also understand how the universe will end. And when you understand how the universe will end, you understand where we are going because we are headed towards the end. We are headed towards the omega point. And when you understand the end, you understand the direction that we're heading and pieces start falling into place on how to get there. So, as you can see, in the beginning of the Gospel of Thomas, they're really laying out a lot of different codes that you're going to have to remember that are going to be repeated throughout the Gospel. This idea of, you know, poverty and riches, a seven-day-old baby. This is going to be themes that are popping up again and again. Jesus said, recognize what is right in front of you, and that which is hidden from you will be revealed to you. Nothing hidden will, be fa will fail to be displayed, and there is nothing that is buried that will not be raised. So again, recognize what is right in front of you, and that which is hidden will be revealed to you. Nothing that is hidden will be failed to be displayed. And this, if, if you've been following along, the interpretation of this should be fairly obvious by now. Recognize what is right in front of you. Just like if you were in a dream. If you were in a dream and you were trying to get someone to realize that they were dreaming, you would be like, hey, look at what's right in front of you. It's right around you. It's all around you. It's kind of like the movie The Matrix. You know, when, when Morpheus is explaining The Matrix to Neo, and he's saying, oh, the Matrix, you know, Neo says, what is the Matrix? And the Matrix, and Morpheus says something like, oh, the Matrix is all around you right now. It's here. It's everywhere. This is basically what, what this is saying. Recognize what is right in front of you. We are in a living dream. The kingdom of God is all around you right here, right now. Let's take it. Stop looking anywhere else. Stop, you know, th this is the, and I keep repeating this, but I just want to really drive this home because people have a tendency to do this. Stop looking anywhere else. You know, stop looking to nirvana, stop looking to heaven, stop looking to any of this escapist ideology. What you're looking for is right around you. We just need to transform it. We just need to change it, we just need to shape it. So recognize what is right around you, right here, right now. His disciples questioned him, should we fast? In what way should we pray? Should we give to charity? From which foods should we abstain? Jesus responded, do not lie. If there's something that you hate, do not do it. For everything is revealed beneath heaven. Nothing hidden will fail to be displayed. Nothing covered will remain undisclosed. So you can see Jesus doesn't really answer their questions. 
his disciples are going, hey, should we fast? Should we pray? Should we give to charity? Like, what food should we eat? What food should we not eat? And Jesus again, again going, saying, hey, 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 nothing hidden will fail to be displayed. Nothing covered will remain undisclosed. He's basically repeating himself. He's going, fuck all, look, it doesn't matter. You know, you don't need to fast. You don't need to pray. You don't need to give to charity. You don't need to know. No, no. Are you, like, are you not listening to me? Hello? He's not even answering their questions. He's just repeating himself. Doesn't matter. You don't need to pray. Doesn't matter. You know, you don't need to do all these things. You need to realize that what you're looking for is right here around you. And, you know, you can see in today's day and age, this would be like, Oh, what, you know, what, what ascended master do I have to meditate on? Or how many crystals should I have in my pocket? And like, no, it's no, stop it. Stop. Nope. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. And this is the difficulty of, we're seeing the frustration of Christ here as Christ is represented as one who has come to the world to help raise humanity's consciousness. And, and the frustration that occurs, trust me, it's quite frustrating, when, when, when you're trying to communicate to someone how to raise their consciousness, and they just don't fucking get it, and they get so distracted by all these worldly things and these weird rituals, and whew, it's like, just no, focus, 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 focus. What you're looking for is within you, and all around you. Look at what's right in front of you. And and this is the thing, you know, the, the frustration here of of, of of Christ. It's just just like, come on guys, come on, come on. It doesn't matter. You don't need to fast, you don't need to pray, you don't need to do any of this shit. Right? Stop it. Jesus said, I have thrown fire on the world. Look, I watch it until it blazes. And this is, this is, uh, you know, basically saying, what, what, what's fire? Fire is a powerful force, but it's also a destructive force. You know, this, the, the, this gospel knows that this information is going to cause problems because People aren't going to like it. They're going to resist it. This is going to cause, you know, it, it's kind of like alchemy. You know, with alchemy, how do you purify gold? You, you subject it to a purifying fire and it burns away the impurities. So fire is both a destructive force, but also a purifying force. And that's what we're going to see, you know, again, you know, just with us how much resistance we face, how many trolls we get, things like that. It's because people resist this information. It throws fire upon the world. And, you know, we're not, it's not like we're trying to cause chaos or anything like that. No, quite the opposite. It just has that effect. Whenever you go to a new paradigm, a new shift, you're going to get people who don't like this. They, people don't like new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things. People like staying stuck in the old past the old conservative ways that's what people like to stick with what they know and when you subject them to something new it's it's can be very disturbing to them when you ate dead things you made them alive when you arrive into light what will you do now this is a really cool verse so basically, when you ate dead things, you made them alive. What does that mean? Well, when you eat dead things, you make them alive. You incorporate them into your being. When you take that something that's dead and you eat it, you ingest it, you incorporate it into you, you make it part of your body, so it becomes you and you make it alive. When you arrive into light, what will you do? This is what's really cool, because truly what we are, are beings of light. We truly are beings of light, and one day, we will be able to subsist on light. Uh, one day, we will be able to subsist on pure light. 
because we are beings of light. And actually, in my book, Transitional Veganism, its subtitle is One Step Closer to Light. Transitional Veganism, One Step Closer to Light. And it talks about this in, in my book, Transitional Veganism. So this is a very, very cool verse. So when you were one, you became two. When you, became, when you become two, what will you do? Here's another code that we have to look out for. One and two is code for the one and the many. So when you were one, you became two. When you became two, what will you do? This is talking about when we were one, when we were the absolute, we shattered and fractured into a multiplicity. This was at the, you know, the Big Bang, the beginning, when we all went from one unified divine mind into a myriad multiplicity of individual nodes, a particularized entity. This shattering into multiplicity. And so when you were one, you became two. When you became become two, what will you do? Well, what's the point then? What do you do when, when you're in multiplicity? Well, it's to return to unity. And that's another throwback to when you understand the beginning, you will understand the end. Because the beginning is unity and the end is unity. And right now we're in a multiplicity. And when we're in a multiplicity, we strive for unity once again. And a quote from Aleister Crowley that I'm paraphrasing, that's an excellent quote, is that the one yearns to become many and the many yearns to become one. And this dialectic is what powers the universe, powers motion, powers life, and powers eternity. When we are one, that's great for a while, but then we, 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 we desire to experience diversity within ourselves and multiplicity or else that would be a very lonely experience. And so we shatter into a mininess. And then once we are a mininess, there comes a point where we want to experience unity again. That's why we seek each other out. That's why we seek friends and companionship and lovers. We want to unite and unify. That's why we have sex. I'm sure that you've had the experience of, of when you have sex, you, you want to unify with that person or persons even more. Sometimes you wish, wow, I wish there was a way that I could even unite with them even more. That's our desire to return to unity. So this dichotomy of the one and the many, and in the Gospel of Thomas, the code of oneness and two-ness, that's what, what it's referring to. And you can see how it all ties together. Understanding the beginning is understanding the end, the oneness and the two-ness, the one and the many, the one that yearns to be many and the many yearn to be one. Now, he, the, here's an interesting part, and if you saw my video on the Gospel of Thomas, the introduction, you remember this. But I'm going to repeat it because it's important, and just in case a few people haven't seen it. Jesus asked his disciples, make a comparison, what am I like? Simon Peter replied, you are a righteous messenger. Matthew replied, you are an intelligent lover of wisdom. Thomas replied, teacher, I cannot possibly say what you are like. Jesus said to Thomas, I am not your teacher. You have drunk from and become intoxicated from the bubbling water that I poured out. Jesus took Thomas and they withdrew. Jesus said three things to him. When Thomas returned to the other disciples, they asked him, what did Jesus tell you? Thomas replied, if I tell you even one of them, he, you will pick up stones and throw them at me and fire would come out of those stones and burn you up. Again, I'm going to go over this real quick because I already talked about this in my intro video to the Gospel of Thomas, but it's important because many scholars think that this is a reference to the Orthodox Gospels, that Matthew and Peter, the other two disciples who get the questions wrong, represent two of the mainstream Gospels, and that it's only Thomas meaning the Gospel of Thomas, that gets it right. 
Jesus says, I'm not your teacher. You have drunk from and been, become intoxicated from the bub bubbling water, which I poured out. This means that Thomas has truly understood what Jesus has said. He has drunk from Christ, meaning he has taken in what Christ has said. So Christ is no longer his teacher because Christ and Thomas are now equals. And Jesus tells Thomas his secrets. And then Thomas tells his, the other disciples, hey, if I told you these secrets, you'd kill me. That's what being stoned meant. And again, many scholars think this refers to uh, the Orthodox Gospels versus the Gospel of Thomas. And if that's the case, what that is saying is that, hey, mainstream Christianity, these Orthodox Gospels are going to hate what the Gospel of Thomas has to say, going so far as to commit murder but Thomas is the only one that gets it right. Jesus said, if you fast, you will bring sin to yourselves. If you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will damage your spirits. Again, this is going back to when the uh, disciples questioned Jesus earlier. He's basically saying, hey guys, all this stuff about praying and what you should eat and all this stuff, it's not important. It's, it, you're, you're, you're not focusing on, on what will really reveal your divinity here. And again, you can see why Orthodox Christianity does not like the Gospel of Thomas. Because they want you to pray. They want you to do all these trivial rules and in the gospel of thomas christ is saying forget all that stuff it's not important stop when you go into a region and walk around in the rural areas whenever people receive you eat what they provide for you and heal their sick and this is sort of continuing what was said in the previous verse because it's saying just eat what people give you um because in the Old Law of the Old Testament, if you're not familiar, there are so many different rules in there. What you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, what kind of clothes you can wear, what kind of fabric you can wear. It's just a long list of really silly rules. And so again, by Christ saying, when you go in the rural areas, just eat what people give you, it's, it's continuing what he said in the previous verses. Don't get all caught up in, in, in these silly rules. Forget the old law. Forget the rules of the Old Testament. It doesn't matter. And then when it says uh, heal their sick, we'll see this later too, what most likely it means, heal their sick, is most likely another code and metaphor for teaching them. Uh, teaching them of their own divinity. T, uh, bringing them knowledge and understanding. And we'll see later why that most likely means that. For what goes into your mouth will not defile you, but what comes out of your mouth can defile you. Again, this is just continuing. It's like, hey, look, it doesn't matter what you eat. Don't get caught up in these stupid laws. But what comes out of your mouth, that can defile you. Basically, yeah, be careful what you say. Be, don't be concerned with these silly laws. Be more concerned with the knowledge that you're imparting upon the world. Jesus says, when you see someone not born from a woman, prostrate yourselves and worship him. He is your father. Now, at first it might... This might seem, wait, like, wait, what is Jesus talking about? This seems kind of, maybe, is this sexist? Or what, what do you mean? What, what's going on here? So, but when you think about it, when what he's saying here is, when you see someone not born from a woman, now what does that mean? Well, everyone is born from a woman. All of us are. We're all born from women. So, so what does Jesus mean when he says, someone who is not born from a woman? Well, this is, again, it's a code and a metaphor. Someone who's not born of a woman is someone that realizes that they're not their avatar, that they're not their body. It's that you have understood that you are an eternal mind. 
So it is someone that has reached divinity. Because they're not born from a woman. Because they realize that they're not an avatar. They realize that they are eternal. They're not born from anything. They are an eternal divine mind. So they, they, they realize they are more than their avatars. And we're going to see this pop up again. So this is something else to keep in mind. But to be clear, even though this is a code and a metaphor, so it's not a, not a sexist thing, I don't like things that are worded like this because people who are stupid can misinterpret this and use it as an excuse to be sexist. I don't like the way this is worded. I am not a fan. Uh, just, just a note on my feelings towards this. I don't like that it's worded. Also about, you know, worshiping that person, you know, that, that's dumb. You don't, 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 don't worship anyone, okay? So that's important to understand. And that's another thing. Remember, this gospel is not perfect. No, 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 no. There's a lot of interesting things here, good things to understand, good things to unpack. But is this perfect? No, no. There's stuff that's wrong in here. There's, there's stuff that's stupid in here. You have to remember that coming from the Hyperion perspective, we can look at this stuff with logic and reason and learn from it, take what's good from it, and the stuff that isn't, you can just get rid of it. Ignore it. Toss it out. So, you know, that, that's important to, to understand. In Hyperionism, we don't have sacred texts. We don't think, oh my God, the Gospel of Thomas, we have to believe in this word for word. And No, if, if, if you read it and you think something in here is just dumb, hey, that's fine. Get rid of it. Don't pay attention to it. Ignore it. And uh, but but it's important to understand again, this this idea of someone not being for being born from a woman. We're going to see this pop up again. What this is is a code and a metaphor for someone that has realized that they are not their avatar. They are divine. They are a divine eternal being. But again, personally, not a fan of the wording. Jesus said, people think perhaps that I have come to throw peace upon the world. They don't know that I have come to throw disagreement upon the world and fire and sword and struggle. For there will be five in one house, three will oppose two, two will oppose three. The father will oppose his son and the son oppose his father and they will stand up and they will be alone. Again, this is about the idea that this information uh, at first causes causes problems and and division ultimately it, it will cause unity because that's what we strive for but it, it can cause division and I'm sure some of you can relate to this in that when you start to step into a higher consciousness and have higher knowledge and higher ideas about the world hey this causes division and maybe this causes friction between you and your family your father or your mother, you, your brother, your sisters, your friends. I mean, not this doesn't happen to everyone, but I'm sure a lot of you can probably relate to relate to this. And this is what what Jesus is saying here. Jesus said, "I will give you that which eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, hands did not touch." and minds have not conceived. Once again, this is referring to information relating to the divine reality, information relating to, uh, you know, a higher consciousness. Again, always think about, if it seems hard to understand, dreams are such a good metaphor. If you're telling someone in a dream that you're going to give them information that's, you know, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, hands have not touched, minds have not conceived. It's, this is basically going, hey, look, this world is an illusion. There is more than this world, more than just the physical. Things that eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, that the people around you can't even conceive of, can't even think of. And we in Hyperionism know this is the source singularity, the frequency domain, the domain of pure mind. You can't touch it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, you can't see it. People around you, it's something they haven't even thought of. But we, 
through reason, through logic, through mathematics, through knowledge, through our intuition, we can access it, we can understand it, we can know it. We can know that source singularity, we can know the frequency domain, we can know the domain of mind, we can step into that higher consciousness. The disciples asked Jesus, tell us about our end. What will it be? Jesus replied, have you found the beginning so that you now seek the end? The place of the beginning will be the place of the end. And I and I really love this because every time the disciples ask Jesus a question, he's he either ignores them or he says, like, what are you, stupid? And this is, this is kind of what he's doing here is the disciples are saying, hey, tell us about the end. What will it be? And Jesus is kind of going like, what are you, dumb? Have you found the beginning? Oh, oh you know, he's kind of mocking them. Oh, oh, you, you, found, you found the beginning, huh? So now you want to know the end? He's basically going, look, guys, you haven't even found the beginning. Why are you talking about the end? Once you find the beginning, you'll know the end. The place of the beginning will be the place of the end. And again, we know this is true because the beginning is the end. It's that sing the source singularity, the place of pure unity, and what, we be, what will be the omega point. The beginning is the end, the end is the beginning, because we live in a cyclical universe, a cyclical reality. And uh, I, I don't know, I just, I, I really like the sarcasm in, in, in the Jesus of, of the Gospel of Thomas, because he's, he's, he's kind of an asshole. <laughs> And, and I like it because he's always so, it's, it really captures well the frustration of being an individual that has incarnated to try and help humanity, humanity and humanity is just not, not getting it. <laughs> you know, the disciples ask Jesus, tell us about our end, what will it be like? And, you know, this is like people who, you know, ask such inane questions that, 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 that just don't matter. Jesus is like, oh, you want to know about your end? I guess you must know the beginning, huh? He's like, guys, you got to know the beginning. Then you will know the end. Once you understand this information, you'll be, able, you'll be able to understand all the rest. It will fall into place. Blessed is anyone who will stand up in the beginning and thereby know the end and never die. Once again, if you know the beginning and know the end, if you know the beginning, you'll know the end and thus you'll never die. Why? Because if you know the beginning, you'll know the end, you'll know the basically the edge pieces of the puzzle, you'll have a grand picture of reality. If you know the beginning and know the end, you'll know that you're eternal and you'll never die because you'll know that you're not your avatar, you're an eternal mind and you were there at the beginning and when you know the beginning, you'll know the end, you'll know you'll be there at the end. If you know the beginning, you'll know that you'll be there at the end because you'll realize what the beginning is and that the beginning is the end. And if you are at the beginning, you are at the end. Do you get it? Any, see, blessed is anyone who will stand up in the beginning and thereby know the end and never die. If you know the beginning, you will know that you were at the beginning. And since the beginning is the end, you will know the end. And since you are at the beginning, you will know you will be at the end. And therefore you'll know that you'll never die because you'll know that you're part of that eternal cycle. The beginning is the end. So if you know the beginning and you know you were at the beginning, you will know that you will be at the end because the end is the beginning. Therefore, you will know you will never die because the end is the beginning and you are part of that eternal circle, a cyclical reality. A circle never ends. The end is the beginning. But I like, I like, I like sassy Jesus. Gnostic Jesus is very sassy. Jesus said, blessed is one who existed before coming into being. Again, one who existed before coming into being. This is one who understands that they're eternal and that they existed before they were born into their avatar. So blessed is one who existed before coming into being. This is one who understands that they have existed before they were born, before they were their avatar. They have understood their divinity. 
if you become my disciples and listens to me, excuse me, if you become my disciples and listen to me, these stones will serve you. Dominion over the hollows, dominion over space time. Think about it this way. If you were in a dream with another dream character and you said, hey, if you understand what I'm telling you and that this is a dream, those rocks over there, they'll listen to you. That's basically what's, what, what, what Christ is saying here. If humanity collectively realizes its divinity, we'll have control over the earth because this is our place to, uh, this is our, our dream realm. Now, once we collectively come together, we first have to transform the world physically. We actually actually have to do it. Once we begin to do that and start to harmonize and uh, gain unity together, increase in our knowledge and understanding, our evolution and our technology, then we'll be able to create you know, a new frequency, frequency channel and literally change the world via our minds at that point in a new frequency domain, in a new uh, frequency channel. So first we have to transform it physically. But then once we do so, create a society of the divine, realize our divinity, become a divine collective, and then create a frequency channel, then we will be able to literally then begin to shape reality mentally in that domain that we have created. So we have to first master the physical. And that means creating a, a, a just society. Uh, and that's what New Terra is. We want to create new terra that actualize the potential of every sim single citizen. A teleological society. In the teleology, the goal of new terra, of that society that we create, is to actualize the potential of every single one of the citizens of that society. And that is creating a society of the divine, a divine society. And eventually, once we have reached that divinity, then we will begin to transcend over even the material. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us what the kingdom of heaven is like. He replied, it is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all. However, when it falls into the worked ground, it sends out a large stem and it becomes a shelter for the birds of heaven. Now this is so cool, I love this, because it's it's very accurate. It's like a mustard seed. It, a mustard seed is an incredibly tiny seed. And that's the source singularity, a dimensionless point, the tiniest thing imaginable. So tiny it has no dimension. It's a domain of pure mind. And yet it blooms into the holos. And you can even see this idea of a mustard seed be going into the ground and then blooming, blooming into a tree is a very beautiful metaphor for the source singularity and the Big Bang. It's a beautiful metaphor for the source singularity and the Big Bang. I just, I, I get really excited about this because it's, it's really cool. Think about how much there is to unpack there. Because the source singularity is a dimensionless point, but in that dimensionless point contains the information for everything. But it has to all come out and actualize. And that's the same thing with, a, with a the tiniest seed in the tree. That tiny seed is so, you know, it's so tiny but it contains all the information for the tree. But it has to actualize, it has to actually grow and bloom. And so it's, it's almost a perfect metaphor for the source singularity being an infinitesimal mathematical point that contains the information for everything, but it then blooms via you know the Big Bang and the Holos and, and everything. So cool, so cool. And this is a really, you know, and, and this is what we are as well. We're all God seeds. That's what we are. We are God seeds. We all have the potential, the information within to become gods. 
and it's up to us then bloom to make the in you know in, internal become external and then we are all as well as being god seeds together we're a collective and we are the seeds of new terra and people ask how how do we change the world by blooming that's how we change the world to create a beautiful garden to sprout and bloom and plant new terra so how do you change the world well first by actualizing your own internal knowledge and then sharing and spreading that knowledge planting more seeds and as that knowledge spreads more seeds bloom and then pretty soon we'll have a beautiful brilliant thriving world i'm saying it's just don't 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 use this information okay use it transform yourself and then go out there and transform the world you know, actually share this information actually share these videos actually spread actually talk about it and actually work on yourselves and learn cultivate it cultivate it like a seed like a garden Jesus saw children being suckled. He said to his disciples, These infants taking milk are like those who enter the kingdom. His disciples asked him, If we are infants, will we enter the kingdom? Jesus responded, When you make the two into one, and when you make the inside the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the upper like the lower, and the lower like the upper, and thus make the male and the female the same, so that the male isn't male and the female isn't female. When you make an eye to replace an eye and a hand to replace a hand and a foot to replace a foot and an image to replace an image, then you will enter the kingdom. This is a really cool verse again. Uh, so first, first of all, um, about the, the, the children being suckled and Jesus saying these infants are like those who enter the kingdom. Again, this is a reference, same metaphor, same code as earlier. Always a reference to children or babies or a reference to understanding the beginning. But then, you know, Jesus goes even further. When you make the two into one, when you create unity, when you make the many into one, when unity is established, and then you have this whole, uh, Oh, it's so, it's so beautiful here. When you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside, this is about, you know, express, you know, ah, there's so much going on here about understanding what existence is and then expressing yourself into the world. When you make the inside like the outside and the upper like the lower, this is as above, so below. And when the female and the male are, are the same, so the male isn't male and the female isn't female. This is again, it, it's, it's all about unity. It's all about realizing that we're divine minds. It's all about realizing that you know, that, that we are, you know, as eternal minds, that we are genderless. It's all about realizing how reality actually is, the divine reality, and the unity that is there, and establishing that, using that knowledge to establish a world that reflects that. That is when you will enter the kingdom. When you have understood all the information, you have incorporated it into yourself, when you understand what things are, when you have made the two into one, when you understand that things are united, when you understand that male and female are just an illusion and that really we're all eternal minds that are genderless and that we aren't really separated but we're united in a divine connected uh, system, then you'll enter the kingdom because in the kingdom well you'll it's here it's, just, it's here you just have to make it you just have to realize it and make it jesus said i will choose one of you out of a thousand and two of you out of ten thousand they will stand up and they will be al uh, alone and this is this is this is really cool well, I mean, well, first, I mean, I don't know if it's cool, but this is basically saying 
This information is hard to understand. And this information, to be able to understand it, is rare. Only one out of a thousand, and two out of ten thousand. I mean, the math doesn't really add up, but you get what, what Jesus is getting at. It's rare to understand this information. And so that's why I always say, if you understand this information, if you understand this information, feel proud. Feel proud of yourself because you are already above the vast majority of humanity. This is the vast majority. You are one out of a thousand. You're two out of 10,000. This vast, the vast majority of the, uh, of the world cannot understand this information. It's beyond them. So if you're grasping this, if you're watching this, if you stick through these videos, if you're here watching this now, feel good about it. Feel proud. Have pride. Have pride in that. There's nothing wrong with pride as long as it doesn't get out of control. There's nothing wrong with being prideful. Being prideful as a sin is something spread by the church to try and strip you of your power. Now, you don't want pride to get out of hand, of course. You know, just like anything. Too much of anything is a bad thing. But in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with being proud. That's part of having power. Be proud of it. There's nothing wrong with being proud of yourself. So have proud. Be proud of yourself. Don't be weak and timid all the time. Be proud of yourself. So, and then you see that he goes on to say, they will stand up and they will be alone. And this means a couple different things. So they will stand up and they will be alone. Well, it, it's, it's, they will be alone in that they are opposed to the rest of the world, but they will also be alone or one in that they form a collective. So they, they, a multiplicity, will stand up and be alone or be one means that those who stand up and understand this for information form a one, form a collective. And also they are alone in that the rest of the world shuns them as outcasts and outliers. And I'm sure you relate. We are the outcasts. We are the outliers, but we form a collective. So we are alone, but we're also strong and united as one, as one. Sorry, here, just uh, one moment. Okay. His disciples said to him, Show us the place you are, for it is essential for us to seek it. He responded, He who has ears, let him hear. There is a light within a man of light, and he lights up all the world. If he is not a light, there is darkness. So basically, when his disciples are saying, Show us the place where you are, for it is essential for us to seek it. By asking, Where are you? Show us where you are. Well, obviously, they're not asking where he is because Jesus is right in front of them. Where you are, he, they're, he, they're basically asking for his consciousness level. Show us where you are. Show us, show us your, you know, where your level is so that we can seek it, so that we can get there too. And of course, as I've said before, you can't just tell people what a higher level of consciousness is like. You, they have to get there themselves. You can give them the tools to get there, but you can't tell them what it's like. Just like a self-aware human can't tell an instinctual animal what self-awareness is like. It's impossible. So a human or a Hyperion that has attained hyper-awareness or an absolute consciousness can't tell a self-aware human what is what that is like. However, they can give tools so that they may reach that themselves. 
And, and so Jesus says, there is light within a man of light, and he lights up all the world. So that's the thing. If you have truly risen to a new level of consciousness, you spread that light and you light up the world. You spread that knowledge. You give humanity the tools. You should be seeking to do that. Because if you have un attained a, a level of consciousness, an absolute level of consciousness, you will go out and spread that light. If you're not doing that, you haven't really attained that level of consciousness because that entails, when you reach that level of consciousness, you realize that you need to spread it, that it's part of it. Because it's a collective consciousness. And that's the thing, if, you, if someone isn't there yet, that probably won't make sense, but you have to be there to understand it. Because absolute consciousness is a level of collective consciousness. It's no longer relegated to an individual mind. It's a collective consciousness. In Hegelian terms, it's what's known as absolute spirit. It's a collective thing. It involves multiplicity. So you, as a singular mind that has attained absolute consciousness, then go out and seek to spread that information and spread that light to form that collective. Because that's, it's part of it. It's integral to it. It's, it. It entails it. It's part of being part of that collective. You need to spread it. It's like being a node in a neural network that realizes that it's part of a neural network and then wants to activate the neural network. So what goes up to activate the other nodes in the network to form a more, more coherent network. You automatically want to and yearn to activate the network. Once you, as an individual node, have achieved network consciousness, you're no longer operating just singly as an individual node. When you, when you as an individual node, have achieved network consciousness, you're no longer just acting as an individual node, you are now acting as the network by going out and trying to activate the other nodes of that network. So there is light within a man of light and he lights up all the world. If he is not a light, there is darkness. If you aren't a light, there's just darkness. It's just you alone in the dark, unaware of the network. Jesus said, love your brother as your own soul. Protect him as you protect the pupil of your eye. Again, this is another reference to absolute consciousness. Love others as though they are your own soul. Because from the absolute consciousness perspective, from the network perspective, they are. They are. Protect him as you protect the pupil of your eye. Because they are. Their eyes are your eyes. From the network perspective, from the absolute consciousness perspective. Every single one of us, as nodes of the network, as monadic minds of the absolute, are the eyes and the ears of the collective, of the universe, of the all, of the bra of Abraxas, of everything. Jesus said, you see the splinter in your brother's eye, but you do not see the log that is in your own eye. Remove the log from your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. And this is basically saying, hey, make sure that you've done your own psychological and inner work before you, you know, try to help someone else do it, or else you're not going to be able to see clearly enough uh, to help them. If you haven't done your own inner psychological work, how are you going to know anything about inner and psychological work to help someone else do it? So do your own inner psychological work so that you can have the clarity of consciousness to help someone else out. And this is through the metaphor of if, if someone else has a splinter in their eye, 
uh, make sure you get the log out of your eye first so that you can see clearly to help them get the, the, the splinter out of theirs. So, you know, if someone has a problem that they need help with, such as a, you know, a psychological inner work issue, make sure you don't have your own problem that's even bigger or else you're not going to be able to help them very well. Make sure you do your own inner work. If you do not fast from the world, you will not find the kingdom. So fasting is abstaining. So if you do not fast from the world, you will not find the kingdom. This means if, if, if you aren't abstaining from worldly things, if you're constantly distracted from worldly things, if you're distracted by, you know, constantly distracted by Netflix and video games and fashion and buying things, you're not doing any inner work and you'll never find the kingdom. You'll never raise your consciousness. You'll never realize what you are. Now, there is nothing wrong with video games and Netflix and clothes. And video games, is that's how we relax. Clothes are how we express ourselves. These are very fine things to do. It's just saying, don't become so obsessed with them that that's all you do and you neglect your inner work. Jesus said, I stood in the midst of the world. I came to them in the flesh. I found all of them drunk. I found not one of them to be thirsty. My soul was saddened by the sons of men, for they are mentally blind. They do not see that they have come into the world empty, and they will go out of the world empty. But now they are drunk. When they are sober, when they sober up, they will repent. And you can hear the sadness in Christ's words here. And, you know, I relate to this a lot. And you've seen, you've seen this, I think you've seen me in streams before when I've related this to you guys. I get sad when people ask questions like, how will this knowledge help me? How's this knowledge going to help my life? And you can see, you know, like, oh, this, this hurts when people ask me that. Because this this is everything. This changes everything. And that's what Christ is relating here. Is it, hey, I came to the world. I incarnated in the flesh. And I found everyone around me drunk. What, what happens when you're drunk? You're, you're you know, again, this is not being literal here. There's nothing fine with having a drink. This means that when you're drunk, you're, you are you can't think properly, you're very distracted, you're more animalistic, you're more primal, you know, you can't reason very well. Again, nothing wrong with, with drinking. I, I'm just saying, this is, this is a metaphor, right? People, you know, uh, they're, they're, in, they're incoherent. So I found them all drunk. And not one of them is thirsty. Remember, thirsty is being, wanting, wanting knowledge, being thirsty for knowledge. Everyone is drunk, intoxicated, incoherent stumbling around none of them is thirsty for knowledge my soul was saddened because they're mentally blind they're not physically blind they're mentally blind they're mentally blind they do not see that they came into the world empty and they will go out of the world empty they're not gonna learn anything they're just gonna go out empty they're gonna come back in again and this cycle will continue this cycle of emptiness. They're just drunk. They're incoherent. They have no thirst for knowledge. But when they sober up, they will repent. And repent doesn't mean like repent of sin or anything like that. This means when they sober up, they'll realize, oh shit, we were focused on all the wrong things. Wow. We need to really rethink things and realize what's truly important. Now we know what's important. Now we're thirsty. You know, sorry for being drunk all the time. That's what, what that means. Jesus said, no prophet is accepted in his own village. No physician heals the people who know him well. And again, this is the ad hominem, 
homonym fa fallacy. And this is something that, you know, I get a lot, we get a lot. No prophet is accepted in his own village. This basically means that people are more obsessed with, uh, th this is um, an attack on the person rather than the, than the information that they're giving. Because imagine a prophet, you know, a prophet can go out to other cities and villages and say, hey, I am here, I'm here to tell, you know, give and impart, impart knowledge. But if a person does that in the place that he grew up, well, basically what happens is they go, oh, yeah, whatever, John, we knew you since you were a baby. Yeah, right, you're a prophet. Yeah, sure, we saw you when you were shitting your pants. You know, there's this tendency to be like, you can't, you can't have anything good to say. Yeah, you think you're divine? Yeah, right. We saw you when you were shitting your pants. We saw you when, you know, you were picking your nose and crying because you scratched your knee or, you know, there's this, this idea of if you know, so you're, you're not going to take that person seriously is basically what they're saying. Uh, and, and, and this is, again, referring to um, an ad hominem fallacy in which you're not really listening to what the person is saying. You are criticizing who is giving the information. And no physician heals the people who know him well. And again, this is why most likely healing is a metaphor for raising people up into a higher consciousness because it, it doesn't make if you are a physician and you're actually physically healing people you you can heal them whether they knew you in that village or not it's only if they don't take you seriously that they're not going to listen to what you have to say that would be a difficulty Jesus said, a city built and fortified atop a hill cannot be taken, nor can it be hidden. And I love this verse. A city built and fortified atop a hill cannot be taken, nor can it be hidden. And so what is this? This is, this is uh, new terra. So, a city built and fortified atop a hill. This is a collective that has reached its high, right? It's raised up. A collective that has attained a higher consciousness. This is New Terra. And it's atop a hill. It cannot be taken, nor can it be hidden. So a collective that has reached a higher consciousness and formed that society and is building that society of the divine. It cannot be taken. It is extremely powerful we will advance exponentially in technology, medicine, everything that you can possibly imagine. And it will be the envy of the world and the world won't be able to take it because we will have reached such heights that it will be uh, impossible. You know, it would be like ants <laughs> attacking a city or something. And nor can it be hidden. It will be the light of the world, shining light upon the world. It will be a citadel of reason, a citadel of logic, a citadel, a citadel of the divine. That is what it means by a city built and fortified atop a hill cannot be taken, nor can it be hidden. This is a powerful divine society of a higher consciousness that has reached that level where it can no longer, it cannot be taken, it cannot be overcome, and nor can it be hidden. It lights up the world through its power, through its emanation. Jesus said, what you hear in your ears, preach from your housetops, for nobody lights a lamp and puts it underneath a bushel basket or in a hidden place. Rather, it is placed on a lampstand so that all who go in and out may see the light. 
Again, this is saying, once you understand this information, tell everyone about it. Spread this information. Spread this knowledge. For nobody lights a lamp and puts it underneath a bush or in a basket or in a hidden place. Rather, you put it on a lampstand so that everyone that goes in may see the light. So this is all about, again, you see this emphasized again and again and again. If we are to establish this citadel on the hill, if we are to establish new Terra, if we are to realize our kingdom of God here on earth, we have to realize our own inner divinity and spread that light, activate the nodes, wake up the other minds of the world to actualize our collective divinity. So don't just do nothing about this. Actually go out and spread this information. Wake up the world. And that's one of the most, you know, again, this is a critical part of the Gospel of Thomas is transforming what is your own inner divinity, but not just doing nothing with it, going out and spreading it so that we can actualize the kingdom right here and now. So, Uh, honestly, we haven't gotten nearly as far as I thought we would. So we're probably going to have to break this up into a few different videos. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be sharing my lecture notes with those on Patreon. But I think this is uh, a good place to stop here. And we will be continuing the Gospel of Thomas next week. So I hope you enjoyed this. Don't go anywhere because we're going to be doing a giveaway for one of my books. But really reflect on this information and so far what's really important to take in is that this has to do with inner transformation and outer transformation not just hiding this information but sharing this information not focusing on a heaven in the sky or a nirvana or a place you go to when you die but transforming and changing the world now and transforming and changing yourself now so that we can establish new terra that powerful citadel that collective consciousness on the hill that cannot be taken or hidden because it spreads and emanates its light upon the world and transform it into a divine society. So we will continue next week, my friends. And I want to give a big shout out to all the supporters on Patreon, especially our top supporters such as White Rabbit, John, Rex, Naruda, all our top supporters and everyone who supports on Patreon. You are awesome. Uh, consider supporting on Patreon if you enjoy my work. There's a lot of deplatforming on Facebook and all of that and YouTube. And supporting on Patreon allows me to continue and you'll get access to our weekly secret live streams and other things like the lecture notes for my talks like this. So make sure you check it out.